Hey guys, it's Lauren Yates from Rave It Up Here. And today we're going to be chatting over Zoom with actor Randall Berger. He is American, but immigrated here to Australia in the 70s. So he technically just calls himself an Australian. He was in the TV show Neighbours, in the movie Kenny, and even had the amazing opportunity to work alongside Anthony Hopkins. We cannot wait to hear about his incredible stories today. So let's get into this interview. Before we get into today's interview, we would like to give a shout out to our Patreons. Irene, Bev, and Michael. If you haven't heard of Patreon before, it is a great way to support us and keep us running and improving. You pick a membership tier that suits you and your budget per month, and in return for supporting us, we'll give you behind-the-scenes content and free stuff. You don't have to give much either. You can be a part of our Patreons for as little as $4 a month. Just visit patreon.com forward slash rave it up. You can even donate through PayPal if you don't trust other sites. You can do so just through our email, raveituptv at gmail.com. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. We appreciate anything you can do to support us. Now, let's get into this interview. Randall, welcome to Rave It Up. It is a pleasure to have you on our show. How are you going today? Fine, fine. It's a... Cloudy, rainy morning in uh, in Castle Maine. I live in the suburbs of Castle Maine in Victoria. Could um, fool us with that beautiful background. That's where we all well, want to no, be right, now, right on the beach. <laughs> yeah, like all the rest of my life, it's complete fantasy. Yes. So um, <laughs> I'm projecting now. I'm projecting my fantasy. It's actually everybody. calming me down too. I'm looking at the background. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that looks so nice. <laughs> You're gonna have to get a little green screen as well, and uh, it just fits on the back of my chair. And you mm. can uh, uh, do some funky stuff yourself. Well, I, I do have a green screen, but I, I really, oh, I love my setup, obviously, which is, you know, dream big. Smile. And uh, I can promote my book as well. So I love my Yeah, and, uh, and the Eiffel Tower, my favorite. The Eiffel favorite. Tower, smile. Yeah. A day without a smile is a day lost. I love that. So <laughs> I just well, want to say. I've lost a lot of days then. Okay. Oh, we need to smile more. I just want to say thank you as well to our mutual friend, writer and producer, Jeanette Collins, for organizing for you to come on the show. Yeah, she How did dumped you guys me in. She, meet yeah, originally? I haven't it's, seen Jeanette. I mean, I, we, school, right? we, uh, we're Facebook friends uh, and have been uh, like a lot of people from my early days in theater, because uh, that's where we, we all started in the hotbed of Santa Barbara, California in the late 60s, early 70s. And I think I last um, hooked up with Jeanette in New York in 81. I think she mentioned in her uh, in her interview, uh, mm. I was there for three weeks in 81 uh, with some other mutual friends. I was, one of the roads I didn't take was working uh, on Broadway um, as a uh, um, an apprentice or a, a intern to Hal Prince. So I um, went there and started setting that up, but it uh, the show was a flop. <laughs> one of his mid eighties flops um, called A Doll's Life. And um, so that didn't eventuate, but um, anyway. But you still keep in contact, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, Jeanette, Jeanette and I, yeah, we keep in contact because you, you just can't shake the, um, the things that uh, helped make you. Um, mm. And Jeanette and I did a lot of musicals in summer theater. And um, even though we didn't go to the same high school, we had a lot of mutual friends in, in television, producers, actors, uh, that we ended up um, working with. Um, she was talking about, um, uh, you know, Brad Dillman and the Bottoms Brothers and all the people that we all worked with. That was mm. where I started as well. Another Santa Barbara uh, person that you may know, uh, Lance Strauss. Uh, Lance and I, well, I, I immigrated to Australia because Lance and his family immigrated to Australia to get away from Vietnam, which mm. was a kind of a conflict they had in the 70s. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so that's how I got here. And uh, so Lance, he he does Elton Jack, is his uh, bread and butter these days. Uh, but he's also starred in things like Les Miserables and, and uh, Evita and what have you. So um, yeah, that he's another Santa Barbara who's ended up here in Australia. There's a few Fantastic. of us. Fantastic, you're taking and over, Joe, woo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Joe Bottoms uh, made a few things out here. Um, I actually did a, a series, a mini series with him once uh, when he was out here. So uh, yeah, there's been a lot of contact with uh, with our home, our base, our roots. Well, it shows how great our country is for you guys wanting to keep coming here. <laughs> <laughs> well, big fish, small pond, uh, Lauren. Mm. Honestly, because 
I was able to work with people and work in industries I never would have been able to in America. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, TV, film, um, stage, stage musicals, plays, um, radio, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, you just, uh, in America, they tend to uh, pigeonhole you or niche, niche you very uh, quickly. So that's where you stay, that's where you work. But out here, you're able to work with amazing people. I mean, it's, they, they bring out a lot of uh, very important actors who, who want to work in Australia. They, uh, most of the American and English actors I've worked with out here have said, geez, I love working here because you guys really enjoy what you do, mm. um, you know, making movies. And they say, everybody chips in and, and uh, the movies come out really well. I mean, you see it in things like The Dressmaker. You can tell that's an ensemble, you know, and that those, those actors really enjoy what they're doing. So uh, that's another reason I've really enjoyed the last 50 years, um, apart from, you know, a few years here and there living in England, et cetera, oh, uh, cool. and being an Australian. Mm. Yeah. So being friends with Jeanette as well, does that mean you're friends with her husband, Peter Anorati as well? Have you no, met no, that? or her, her uh, those big muscular boys she's got, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't want to uh, try to mash her on a dark street because those four big hunky people would just crush you. Yeah, and she's uh, got an amazing, <laughs> yeah, amazing family. And I, I didn't know half the stuff when I listened to her, um, her show with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All of that. Well, no, honestly, it was a revelation because we've kept in touch as people, not as professionals. So I didn't know a lot of those things that uh, Jeanette had done. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad my interview helped you then. Well, it's I great. I didn't know about friend a bit more. <laughs> what a great show. I mean, I, 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 I didn't know about it. So I'm, I'm now a fan. Oh, so, thank uh, you. I'll, 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 I'll listen. Yeah. I'll Woo. subscribe. Uh, I'm a, um, See, Randall's subscribing, Spotify. guys. <laughs> Spotify guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I decided to put it on Spotify, you know. Yeah. About eight, nine years I was on radio and I just found that wasn't where my audience was anymore. People is were that your listening background online. Was, is your background was radio? Yes, it is. Um, Like a showbiz radio or is a... Yeah, or um, I was in community radio for nearly 10 years, probably about yeah. nine years. Yeah, and, I, used to, I started in radio... Um. And it's always been my first love as a copywriter and uh, I did community radio and I always think uh, the theater of the mind is a much more exciting place to work. Mm. And um, so, yeah, I did a, used to do a, a music theater uh, show. Uh, and I also did an in-flight entertainment music theater show for four years with, uh, hosted Ooh. by Hugh Jackman called um, On Stage On Screen. And people used to say they used to fly. I mean, it is flattering. They used to say, oh, we used to fly uh and said because we liked listening to hugh he knows so much about musicals but and he used to laugh because he says no it's not i don't write it uh, my friend writes it so that was before hugh became hugh mm. and um yeah it was a great show and it, it became a point of difference but i loved programming it it is like community radio but it's a, a captive audience of people you know in their seats with the little stethoscopes if you remember those yes um <laughs> Well, yeah, I definitely loved radio too. It was just that whenever I'd put the recording up the day after for people that missed it live, more people were listening to that than they were live. So I was like, you know what? I'd love to do interviews from home and just record stuff from home and then just go out and do interviews if if I, if I want to. Um, so it's been giving me a lot more flexibility, which is fantastic. We never had this in, in our day. Uh, with Hugh, I used to interview people um, who were in town doing shows um, you know, Caroline O'Connor and people that he'd worked with and um, Debbie Byrne and, and people, uh, Nancy Hayes and Jill Perryman that I'd worked with. And I used to ask the questions and they'd answer and then we'd go and post, post fix it. And he would ask the questions and he couldn't tell that it wasn't a live interview. Mm. So um, yeah, w that was how we had to do it back in the old uh, steam radio days. But now of course with zoom and um, uh, you know, all of that, it's uh, so much easier to, mm. um, to uh, do an interview, you, you, you've ju you're just basically recording this and you can strip the audio or you can post edit. It becomes a way, uh, an MOV file. And it's just, it's a great, um, yeah. I, I think uh, technology these days um, is, has just made our jobs just so much easier. Oh, of course. Uh, like I say, uh, uh, my wife teaches university at four different campuses from the dining room, you know, um, I'm traveling, she, but in my home. <laughs> yeah. 
because that's just what where COVID has driven us. But um, it's not a really bad helps. it's not a bad thing, you know. Yeah. Well, you've definitely seen a lot of different changes then over the years because. Oh yeah, because I'm, I'm old. Been... I'm old. Uh, no, I'm yeah. also. I was like, wow, you've been an actor since thirteen. You know, mainly in school and some of yeah, yeah, and yeah, plays. summer stock, yeah. That is quite young, you know, to already start doing what you've done for the rest of your life. Did you know that you wanted to be an actor or did you also have, you know, the plan B as they call it? Oh, well, I had plan A, which was to go into a job, to do a college degree and go into a job. But I I just kept getting drawn back. And then when, um, you know, my lifelong friend emigrated to Australia, like I say, ostensibly to get away from the Vietnam War, but ironically came closer to Vietnam. Um, he uh, uh, he was saying, gee, there's lots of things to do here, you know? And uh, and so I came to Australia, you know, and you could, we were doing musicals straight off Broadway, off of Broadway, like, uh, you know, Annie or The Wiz or, or things like that, uh, Le Miserable. We were often the second production in the world. Mm. And, you know, Trevor Nunn would come out and direct and all these um, famous directors. So you got to really work with exciting people who were at the coalface and it rubbed off, you know, professionally, we all became much, much better for having uh, been in this kind of like um, hotbed of, of, of theater in Australia. Mm. Uh, I mean, Fun Home that they're doing, the MTC and STC are doing right now, which I think you just had or is, are about to have the musical Fun Home, uh, you know, that's a, an, an incredibly good production of the Tony award-winning musical. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it yet. No, no. But uh, I guess it'll be in Sydney after Melbourne, but it's a, you know, it's a show, it's a musical set in a, in a funeral home about lesbians. Um, you know, you think, wow, ex exciting uh, topic. Um, you know, it's like you're in town. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think, wow, subject matter. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, Australia is an exciting place to live and work. Um, you can live, you can work with actors here that you, you wouldn't even get a chance to meet on the street, you know, Anthony Hopkins or, yeah. or James Coburn or people like that. And like you said, I started at 13. Um, Santa Barbara being only, I guess, 150 miles or 100 miles from LA about 90 minute drive is, uh, you know, close enough that you're, you can go down and see things, but things can come up to see you. And we often would be tested or auditioned or there'd be test screenings of things. And a lot of that crop of actors from the late sixties, early seventies went to Hollywood. Um, you know, the four Bottoms brothers, um, Randy Mantooth um, was an emergency for years and years and years. Um, Howard McGillan, who I worked with a lot, uh, who was Broadway's longest running Phantom. Um, I, I played opposite him several times because we were just moving through the count through the years together. And um, yeah, exciting, exciting. And me and Janet, uh, Jeanette, that's ex exciting times for our generation. And um, Brad Dillman, who was a, a famous actor and a, a, uh, he had um, worked in, in, in incredible um, Broadway plays, lived in Santa Barbara and did a lot of Hollywood films, some of them good, some of them B, you know, like The Third Planet of the Apes and stuff like that. But he was an exciting actor, but he had this class that uh, Jeanette did after I left. I'd been invited into, but I had already decided to emigrate. So I, I th said, thanks. Uh, Howard went in, all the Bottoms brothers went in. He had it limited to 10 people, that's it. You had to wait for somebody to leave um, uh, just by natural attrition or going into theater or film. And uh, and this was a, a weekly class and it was so exciting. Uh, and that's one another reason that Santa Barbara became a wonderful kind of hotbed. It was the original Hollywood, by the way, before Hollywood, the first studios, Flying A Studios, uh, was in Santa Barbara and was making movies um, in like 1910. But of course, you know, Melbourne is the birthplace of the feature film. 1906, uh, the story of the Kelly Gang was the world's first feature film. It was made in Melbourne. So there you go. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, well, quick fact. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, you it's, move it's, to... ver it's there's very few bits of it are left, but um, yeah, it was made here in Melbourne, uh, shown at the Athenaeum, and uh, literally was the first feature film by oh nearly five or six years before somebody else thought, gee, you know, if we we showed a film that lasted an hour and a half. Uh, and we wouldn't have to pay the actors, uh, you'd be able to keep the, uh, the audience in there and make lots of money. So that's, where, uh, that's how the feature film came about. It, it wasn't just a novelty, it became a, an industry and that's all started here. Ah. Of course, uh, 11 of the first feature films were all about bush rangers because we had this kind of thing in those days. And uh, Ned Kelly had only been uh, in a box for, I think he was uh, 25 years when the first film was made. So uh, it was fairly recent memory for those people. So seeing a Bush Ranger movie was exciting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm digressing. Keep me no, on track. Okay. Lauren, so did, keep me on track. Did you move to Australia on your own too? Because only at yeah. 19, like what, yeah. really just coming out of school. Was that also a little bit scary? Like that's No, a no, I went, to college. I went to college for a year and a half. Uh, no, it wasn't scary. I, I was ready. I mean... To leave home and to leave Santa Barbara, which was, is an, an people say, how could you leave Santa Barbara? It's so pretty, you know. It's like this behind me here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's a, an idyllic town, but a lot of my friends are still there and they're pumping gas, whatever. You, you, it was a bit of a trap. Um, so I think I was glad to go, mm. and I had somewhere to go. Um, like I say, there were roads I didn't take, which was to Hollywood or to. Uh, San Francisco or to other uh, places to start working professionally but instead I emigrated to Australia and um, it was fairly easy in those days they they wanted migrants I mean uh, they actually gave you part of your ticket mm. um, uh, have part you of your fare since yeah. as well because do you still well, have family I went back I think there? after uh, I went back the first time after three years I go back to keep my name in the will you know just to don't forget me. Hi. <laughs> I do um, still exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I used to go back um, every once in a while. Last time I went back was just BC before COVID in uh, November 9th, uh, 2019. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. My parents That's are still hard. alive, brother and sister are still alive. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's a bit of a pilgrimage rather than a, I don't say going home. I just, you know, because for 50 years, this has been my home. Yeah, just visit I, the family. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm, a card, I'm a card-carrying Australian, yeah. and um, and I love and I love it. I, I kiss the ground every day. Well, I don't actually. <laughs> um, to, to actually think I I am so lucky, and every day I look at the screen, I look at the news or whatever, and think, my goodness, I'm so lucky to live in Australia because half of the world still wonders where the hell it is. Yeah um you know and uh they think you know that nothing happens here or but everything happens here oh sure does well, you're have you seen the trailer for, have you seen the trailer for baz Luhrmann's elvis yet yes it looks amazing wow. <laughs> and that was filmed here in australia Woo! Uh, yeah just on the gold coast uh, i've done a few things there at warner's and um yeah there's it, 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 it's an amazing facility there uh at um on the gold coast uh we've mm -hmm. got the uh the dockland studios here which uh, i i didn't realize the things being made here uh you know san andreas with uh, the rock film, films like that are being made here and people don't even know I didn't um, there's even know another that. um <laughs> there's another uh series called um what's the one about the hole that opens up in la you know and uh people fall through oh um i'm sure anyway. we'll probably remember later <laughs> yeah yeah somebody will ring in <laughs> is that what they usually say calls in now guys yeah anyway this uh that was filmed uh, only a few miles from here in castle maine uh -huh. uh, and um that was uh um you know that's another thing that people don't even realize that's not i mean it, it looks like I, I did mission impossible here for three years uh, i was in mission impossible that was filmed in in Melbourne for three years and people thought my father used to watch it every week and he says I saw you on Mission Impossible um when did you come home why didn't you tell us because <laughs> Australia can look like anything and anywhere and we have so many people that live here um 
and it, it wouldn't um jane badler who starred in v and was famous for eating a guinea pig she started missing impossible for three years and uh, she now lives here a lot of uh, american actors have come out and lived here because yeah. it's such an attractive place and, a, and such a wonderful place to work uh so yeah there's um a lot of reasons that i'm happy that i live in australia oh, you can so cut glad. that all out you can cut that all out later um no it's great to hear about all of uh why you love australia <laughs> and i gotta say like something that really makes you a pure aussie in my opinion is being on the tv show neighbors you play yeah, three, three times as th three times as three different uh, people um yeah how is it going on a show and playing three different characters like did any of your fans notice that? <laughs> no, I, I was in um, Prisoner, I think, a couple of times as well. It's, you know, it's a character. I mean, same same thing happens in America. You know, character actors go on. I was in Sting, uh, a series called Stingers a few times. Um, you just don't, you just don't think about it. But there aren't that many people here. So when they've got to, they've got to do a show and they've got to fill a cast, they sometimes pick um they sometimes, um, you know, have to use the same people again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, was, Neighbors was, was um, 1986, I think. In 1987, I was... 1987, and then Larry I was first Morris in, that, in yeah. 2012. Yeah. Mm. That's me. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, why didn't they just bring you on as the same character? But anyway. <laughs> oh, no, because I think the first time I was... Uh, it was Craig McLaughlin's first block. Mm. Uh, Kylie and Jason were still there, so... She hadn't done her uh, songs yet, but or they hadn't been married yet. So it was really, really early. Mm. And um, Craig, of course, it was in his contract. I, I would assume that he had to take his shirt off in every scene because uh, he was so buff. And I think I caught him in bed with my wife or something. Um, can't remember now. Uh, Barbara Ramsey, another American actress, played my wife. And um, yeah, that was the original, uh, uh, like original neighbors. Alan Dale was there. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it was amazing. See, that makes you a pure Aussie being on that show. That on neighbor, away, on like... neighbor, well, I'll go further back, Against the Wind or or something like that, Far Lap. Uh, yeah, it, iconic Australian stories. Uh, does that make you a pure Aussie? My grandmother was Australian, so actually it's in the blood. Oh, but, okay. Um, yeah, uh, I actually came back. The boomerang came back, but uh, she'd been five generations of Australians before she went to America. Huh. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's just another uh, branch of the tree. Well, but, another yeah. great thing was, um, 2006, you're in the movie Kenny. How was that experience? How long were you on set for? Just well, Kenny or... was uh, Clayton Jacobson was a good friend. Uh, I'd done his final year film in um, at Swinburne Film and Television in 1986. Uh, he made a, a, a film that I was in. And I, I have always want, always done, I guess you call them student films, uh, but I think they're more like uh, experimental films to give pay pay it forward, you know, give something back, let them work with a professional that gives them more shades of of gray than one, and they don't have to, because usually when they're making these films, they've raised ten thousand dollars or whatever, or their parents have put it up, and they they they're using neighbors and and brothers and sisters. And I, I used to like to do it so that they had it, some people, but I wanted film experience. I wanted experience in front of the camera. So, and I think a lot of actors, I always say, go and do some student films. Um, if you want to be a screenwriter, read screenplays. Do what you want to do as a, as a form of learning. So I did Clayton's film. And then later when he was making Kenny, Kenny had started out as a short film for the St. Kilda Film Festival. Um, a little 40 minute short about riding along with this guy that works in toilets. And the short is still embedded in the feature film of Kenny. Oh. Because it won the St. Kilda Film Festival or, or got, and the guy that owned the, the toilet company said, hey, how would you like me to pay for you to make a, a real film? <laughs> I love when they say a real film. Yeah. Uh, and so they got, I think $500,000 and actually filmed the bits with the son, which is actually Clayton's son. Uh, Shane is his brother. So it was this family affair and the father was their father. Uh, people contributed. They didn't film every day. It wasn't like a, 
um, like even my daughter who was a film student, uh, when Clayton was on screen and, and couldn't run the cameras, she was one of the camera people. So she hasn't even started film school. She's got a feature film credit. So it was a, a Kenny was a, uh, I would call it a cooperative film. It was a, this amalgam of energy uh, from all these different people. They, they needed to film on the plane when they went to, uh, to um, Nashville or Louis, Louisville or something. And I, because I was doing the in-flight, I arranged for them to meet the people at ANSET to borrow one of the planes that was sitting on the ground. <laughs> So, so, you know, they, they just plugged it in and, and filmed it on it for a couple of days. So it was, everybody was putting into it. So I was in it as a passenger on the plane, sitting next to Kenny. And I think, and I also was a, a radio announcer when they were editing, they said, hey, listen, we need some guy uh, on the radio in the taxi cab um, when Kenny's going to the poop pumper convention. So I literally phoned it in. They, they just put a microphone next to the speaker on the phone and I, you know, hey, here we are in sunny Louisville today. And, you know, it's wonderful degrees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this show is brought to you by, uh, you know, so-and-so's barbecue ribs. And and that's in there. So the, Kenny is a wonderful film. It It's the only film that was ever running for, I think, six months after the DVD came out because people wanted to be in the cinema. Because when you are laughing with a crowd of people, you laugh harder. Yeah. And so uh, it, it almost became like a, a Rocky Horror Picture Show or one of those films that you tended to go to to see it as a group. Um, yeah, no, uh, Kenny was, uh, Kenny was a, a unique experience. Yeah, it sounds um, like it. I still haven't watched it, to be honest, but uh, I'm going to now. Oh! I know, right? Oh! What an Australian classic! <laughs> well, it, it is, it is, but to to know its genesis and the fact that it's several different projects sort of needed together and and well, I have more rooted, respect for it yeah, now, don't yeah. I? Yeah, it's just so it hard to keep real, up with all of them now. Oh. Yeah, it is a really, really exciting uh, genesis of a film, you know, of a project. Yeah, it came from back there. Because another thing I want to do, and I do do, is write screenplays and I have for many years uh, I think I first just about to bring in, that up <laughs> yeah 1981 and I um yeah it, it, I, I believe that as an actor you learn how to put it on paper because you have to limit yourself to what the audience can see and hear too many people write screenplays with exposition in them explaining things and so what you're actually doing when you're writing a screenplay is limiting yourself to only what can be seen and heard mm. and that is the hardest thing ever uh to do so and i pride myself in in focusing on that and i've uh, written a couple of things some of them which get, you know they pick them up they read them they say oh that's really exciting let's let's make this film and then it peters out i don't care i i've put something together on paper that exists mm. So um, well, you started like writing and became a copywriter the year yeah, you got yeah, married well, as well. Is there a reason in particular you started the year that you got married? <laughs> uh, you, you, I, I became a writer. Um, I turned acting into writing, you know, what, what's deliverable. So that's how copywriting came about. Uh, radio copywriting, mm. to be specific, is you, you know how to uh, well, deliver a line or what's deliverable. So... And then it became uh, other things. So uh, copywriter, I worked on Bullshit Boulevard in advertising for quite some time. Um, I did- Bullshit um, Boulevard, I like that. <laughs> you know- the, the, I agree the, with that, yeah. <laughs> what do they call it in, in New York? Madison Avenue. Um, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I worked in advertising. Uh, I worked as a writer, I worked as a creative director uh, in-flight entertainment. I used to do muse uh, mu interpretive museums is, is, is an exciting thing for me because what you do is people go to a museum and they you want to make it experiential. So you don't just have a glass case with things in it saying, oh, that's somebody's pocket watch and that's so many that's somebody's pocket knife. You want to you want people to experience things. So I used to write soundscapes and and uh, and things for people to go into museums and, and travel through them. And become uh, and learning the experience. That's a that's a form of theater as well. And there are some exciting museums in the world that um, 
uh, do just that, you know. I think uh, the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, you're given the number that of somebody of roughly your age and gender who was at Auschwitz or, or uh, Birkenau or something, and they um, travel through the museum with that number. And then in the end, they find out what happened. Mm. So it, it allows you to make it more a subjective experience, which is, I think, very, uh, very much what museums and, and things like that should, should do. It's like this uh, Van Gogh um, Lume thing where people go in and you're in Starry Starry Night in projections. That makes that painting now a, more of an experience. So that's, mm. I think, that, I don't know if that's in Sydney yet, but it's very popular in Melbourne. Yeah, well, you're giving me a whole new respect just to all the, you know, different uh, writing that you do see in a museum and the plaques explaining things. You don't really think about all the work that's been put into that as well. You're yeah. more just looking at what a, the artist has created. So thank you for opening our eyes to that as well. <laughs> Well, again, it's a theater, it's a form of theater. So I guess I, I, uh, in the last 50 years, I, like I say, in Australia, you get to work in a lot of different areas. Mm. And that's, that's one of them. Well, when I was doing my research on you, I'm like, what can't this guy do? Because even you're a wedding and funeral celebrant as well. well and that's... just from looking at a few of like your Facebook posts over the last year and even the year before. Oh, no. Yes, oh, I know. I go so back. Inappro- oh. <laughs> They're so inappropriate. Uh, but obviously, it seems like COVID has really uh, not only ruined a lot of things for us, but it's also expanded how we do things differently. And even we were just talking about Zoom and live streaming before. You're even doing Zoom and live streaming of weddings and funerals. That is really cool. Um, <laughs> that was yeah, one so post I, that yeah, I had a uh, look at. Yeah, well, that's the, um, that's the thing. Uh, COVID made us do certain things a different way. Uh, I did a few uh, funerals. I, I, I did a wedding that the woman was um, was dying of cancer, so she couldn't be exposed to these people either because she was uh, immunocompromised, and um, most of her family were in Queensland. So we actually had t- uh, ten people at the wedding, and then everybody else was via. Um, like Facebook Live or something. YouTube or whatever, whatever yeah. it was. It was a, a live thing. I had another friend, uh, her funeral was, uh, she was a very famous uh, drama teacher. Uh, her funeral went all around the world. So they, they coordinated wow. the time uh, so that people from England and wherever she worked could log on and, and see it. Um, yes, that's, that's a thing. Uh, I became a, a, a wedding celebrant mainly for marriage equality. My brother is gay and was in a relationship and for many, many years couldn't get married. And that kind of, I focused on that. And uh, it's also a very good thing for an actor and writer because you're, it's a performance, but you also write it. So you put the emotions into words, you perform them, you marry them. So there's a lot of actors uh, out there who are also wedding celebrants. Yeah. And um, not only because you're being married by a personality, I don't see it like that. You're being, you, you have a person who can create an emotional moment. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, and I, I did a, a same-sex wedding almost immediately, became legal three years ago. And uh, I was very uh, chuffed about that. And um, so I, I was quite into the, marriage equality movement and um yeah i'm a ardent pro-vaxxer uh, uh you, you mentioned the fact that COVID is uh that i, I tend to comment on things in um on facebook and uh, get put in facebook jail all the time because i i can't talk i don't suffer fools gladly uh there's an, an old saying hmm. so i um i often sort of tell people what i think and that's not what uh, mr zuckerberg thinks um, oh, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Freedom of speech? But anyway, that like, feels like a whole yeah, other podcast. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, look, I, I'm still standing. Good. <laughs> but I like some of the stuff you put because it also expanded my mind to, wow, that is how we'd have to be doing wed- weddings and funerals now. And when we're all living all around the world, different states, at least even 
after COVID that we could continue doing that so that, oh, you can't come to my wedding or you can't come to so-and-so's funeral. That's fine. We're going to live stream it. You can still be a part of it. Um, but also there's a few like posts about funerals that you put up um, that really open my eyes to other possibilities, like planting a tree instead of a burial. And then another one, which I found interesting was a news article you put up, a Dutch man inventing a coffin that turns bodies into mushrooms. I was like, what is that? <laughs> But I was like, interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit more about that. Well, it is, it is an important thing to consider. People think embalming is, uh, is good, but you, you'll, you'll never decompose. Mm. You, you are basically like those plasticine um, bodies that you see in those exhibits. You know where they, you actually see the inside the body. That's um, or a cadaver if you've ever studied medicine or, or physiology. Um, yeah. I don't think people think about that, you know. Yeah, well, um, once you're dead, people are like, eh, doesn't matter. <laughs> or, or the fact that cremation is is punching a very big hole in the ozone layer with your uh, CO2. You know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, cremation creates a lot of of uh, of carbon. Mm. So now, in the last ten years, Australia's grown up, and you can now be buried. Uh, just in a cardboard box or a fiberboard box or just a shroud and and go back to nature mm. and i think uh you know there's a better way uh, to do it well people think oh no i can't think of them being you know uh being corrupted and and being worms and all that but no that's just the way it should be mm. i mean i'm not saying we have to do like the Indians do where you put yourself out for the vultures or something or yeah. feed you the sharks. But, you know, whatever whatever you can do to leave this world a little bit better or the same as you came to it, mm. uh, we should do it. Definitely. So uh, That's why I wanted to bring it up. Thank you very much. See, guys, expand your mind. Look at that news article. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll link it on this on the underneath this interview too, so people check it out because it was a very interesting article. All about uh, 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 sort of like recycling people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Solar, inventing that coffin. Solar, so yeah. Solar Green was set in twenty twenty two. You know, did you know that? No. You know the movie Solar Green with Charlton Heston. I haven't watched it. Oh, get it. <laughs> There's only oh, so sorry. many movies my bald, and shows my bald you can spot. Oh. Watch, watch in a day. <laughs> anyway, Solid well Green is, uh, was Edward G. Robinson's last film. And oh. it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Cheesy old Hollywood sci-fi, but uh, uh, with Charlton Heston being Charlton Heston. But um, it is an amazing film. And they thought when they made it in the 60s that, oh, uh, let's think of somewhere in the future. And, and they thought of 2022. And that's this is when it is, uh, Soil and Green. Uh, I won't give it away because you haven't seen it, but mm. everybody else in the world has. Um, <laughs> you should try to you should try to see Soil and Green. Okay, I'll add it to my very long list of stuff to check out, including yeah, Kenny. Kenny, Kenny, Soil and Green. Uh, yeah, you're already creating this whole list during this interview for me. <laughs> Now, it, we're about to also play a game in a second, Randall, and you can verse Jeanette, which would be very interesting. Uh, oh, Jeanette and Peter with uh, 45 and 47. Or 45. Oh, look at that. You actually remembered. I was just I, uh, an elephant that anyway. never forgets. I, I remember all of it. You must so have just, you want to play watched that. it this morning. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, though, do you have any advice for our audience who might want to follow their dreams of becoming an actor as well? I uh, don't don't just dream do it um i mean i started off in a bit i guess non-professional theater i don't like to say amateur theater but although amateur means for love mm. so um yeah do it do the films uh there uh, every year the uh film schools advertise for actors and you don't necessarily have to be a professional actor or having gone to acting school in fact, um, I think acting schools, um, you really have to be an actor first so you can be polished rather than going there to learn to act. Mm. Um, uh, so I would suggest you go and do some plays, do some films. There are a couple of casting things online. 
I think uh, is it Star Now? Mm. Um, you can go on and they'll advertise films, uh, student films, etc., in your area. Um, sign up for one of those. I still do them. Um, uh, like I say, I try to do at least one a year, a student film, uh, to pay it forward or pay it backwards. I, I, I never understand nice. that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because I think it's important for me to, because uh, student directors often have great new ideas that because they haven't been tainted by the system, mm. you know, and have to make a movie that suits a certain thing. You know, I've made some wacko stuff, you know, and I've played some amazing roles, you know, um, the devil, Jesus Christ, you know, all this kind of stuff that you wouldn't get to do in, in necessarily in mainstream uh, work. So uh, that's my advice for people is don't just dream it, just do it. Mm. Um, and uh, there's, you know, of course you're gonna have to starve for your craft, uh, but if you go and do things that interest you, uh, you'll never, you'll never lose. Yeah. You'll never lose. So uh, yeah, that's what I would it's suggest. Very true. For our, that's what for I would our, say. It's a for our audience is go out and do it. Um, I mean, my three now adult daughters, um, one of whom lives near Ukraine. I should. I hope she's okay. Um, the, uh, you know, you, you, one of them went into film. One of them is in animation. One of them's a theater producer. You know, there are a lot of. Uh, she produces a, a theater festival in. Um, Latvia, uh, an annual festival of, of new theater. Um, and another one's doing her final year of animation at VCA in, in Melbourne. And the other one became a, a, did a bachelor of film and television. She's now, uh, you know, making more money than God as a um, geologist <laughs> in West Australia. Uh, wow. So, I mean, I think there's a, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that don't have to be actor or movie or screenwriter. There's a lot uh, under the umbrella. Yeah. Mm. The best advice for screenwriters, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Lisa Deathridge, Dr. Death, they call her. She's a Hollywood script doctor and teaches here at RMIT. She said, you know, read 50 scripts before you write one. Yeah. Learn by osmosis. You should, um, you know, five of them you've seen, five of them you've never seen, then go and see them. Five of them you hated as movies, then read the screenplay and work out why you hated them. So a, a breadth of screenplays, read them, and then you, you'll be amazed how those, the habits of good screenwriters rub off on you and bad screenwriters show you the pitfalls. Yep. And um, that's, that's the best way to do it. That's a very amazing advice. Yeah. Again, don't go to film writing school. Make the industry your school. Oh, that's a good oh, one. Oh, that's profound. And yes. you've, got that on, you've got that on tape. I, I, I want do. a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you just that snippet for you. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. No. no, thank you for that amazing advice. Hopefully the people take okay, it on Okay, let's have well. the 40 question. What is it? A, a, a 60, 60 seconds. It's our two-minute hot seat. <laughs> yeah, two-minute hot seat, okay. So what I do is I ask you various questions. You just yeah. have to pick your preference. You know the drill. So yeah. it's like dogs or cats, singing or dancing. And you have to answer as many questions in two minutes as possible. So okay. when we finish, we'll see we sit on the leaderboard up against everyone else that's played the game on the show, but also your friend Jeanette Collins, who you know now, 47 questions she answered. And so Peter gonna... was 48? Was yes, Peter? very yeah. true. Oh, yeah. so there you we must go. have just listened to it this morning, right? <laughs> no, no, I listened to uh, just literally after you'd recorded it a couple of weeks ago. Oh, thank uh, you. As soon as, it, as soon as it went up, uh, Jeanette says, oh, it's up. So I, I had to listen. Um, Obviously still fresh in your memory. I no, just had a quick I, question, Like I though. say, I never forget anything, <laughs> anything. I have a quick question for you, though, because obviously you are American, but you've been here since the 70s, so you pr practically just call yourself Australian. Would you rather the Australian list or the American list? I have both for you. <laughs> 
Uh, hard to, hard to say. Uh, oh, well, you know. The only real differences like, is like, instead it's of like Burger asking, King and Mc, uh, like uh, Burger yeah. King and McDonald's and stuff. Um, yeah, or Sydney or Melbourne or Los Angeles in New York is another question. Oh, well, so. I, give me the Australian list then, because Australia? like I say, I've yeah. lived here for 49 of the 50 years. I lived for a year in England and. Uh, you know Australia very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, six weeks in Paris. You know, I've lived in different places, but mainly australia yeah okay we'll go to the australian list then are you ready randall yeah fire away okay here we go three two one facebook or instagram facebook iphone or samsung iphone apple or android apple rap or rock music uh rock rock or pop rock pop or country pop beach or mountains beach beach or pool beach skiing or snowboarding Skiing. Comedy or action? Uh, comedy. Blondes or brunettes? Blondes. Sweet or salty? Uh, salty. Sunglasses or hat? Uh, hat. SUV or convertible? SUV. Mac or PC? Mac. PlayStation or Wii? The PlayStation. Singing or dancing? Singing. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Italian or Chinese food? Italian. The summer or winter? Uh, winter. Kim Kardashian or Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> I'll have Scarlett. Johnny Depp or Will Smith? Uh, uh, Depp. Mall or online shopping? Uh, online. Cinema or home movie? The cinema. Ice cream or gelato? Ice cream. Cake or cookies? Uh, cake. Cookies or cookie dough? Uh, cookies. Family or friends? Family. Football or soccer? Uh, footy. Christmas or your birthday? Uh, Christmas. Night or day? A night. Bus or train? Train. Straight or curly hair? Uh, curly. Eye color blue or brown? Brown. Vampire or werewolf? <laughs> Vampire. <laughs> Texting or calling? Uh, calling. Sydney or Melbourne? Oh, Melbourne. <laughs> Friday or Saturday? Friday. Uh, TV or movies? Uh, TV. Starbucks or Gloria Jeans? Neither, but I'll say Starbucks. <laughs> snow or surf? Um, snow. Harry Potter or Twilight? Uh, Harry Potter. Family Guy or The Simpsons? Uh, Simpsons. McDonald's or Hungry Jacks? <laughs> <laughs> Hungry Jacks. Red Rooster or KFC? Uh, Red Rooster. Fr French fries or chips? Oh, chips. Burger or hot dog? Burger. Pies or sausage rolls? Uh, pies. Tomato sauce or barbecue sauce? Uh, tomato sauce. Guitar or drums? Guitar. Sneakers or thongs? Sneakers. Bike or scooter? Bike. Leather or denim? Denim. And we're out of time. Wow. <laughs> Started going into questions I haven't done before for a while. Really? How many questions do you think you answered? I have no idea. <laughs> do you think you beat Jeanette and Peter? Yes. <laughs> yes, you definitely did. Woo! So they answered 47 to 48. You have answered 53. <laughs> the, year That's incredible. the year I was born. Um, and no, was I've got to correct you. You've got to, you said things like Friday. It's Friday. You've got to correct your pronunciations because you're not doing the Aussie way. It's Friday. It's, oh, I've always said Friday. Yeah, it's, it sounds better. Yeah. And nah. anyway, I, I was thrown a few times. And I you interview a lot people, of Americans, so yeah. you <laughs> should say you should let people say neither because I don't like Gloria Jeans or Starbucks. You can't say neither if you want. <laughs> but would that count as an answer? Yes, it would. Okay, because yeah. uh, there were a couple there I wanted to say neither. But so, you're so 53. On, you're Yay. sitting number 35 on the Rave It Up leaderboard. And out of Zoom interviews, you're sitting second. Or oh, third, third, sorry, third. For how long? I don't know. We'll find for out. Having, <laughs> having waffled. But uh, so I'm 35 on the leaderboard for answering. Yeah. What, there's people, there's 35 people above me. Yeah, well, 146 people have played this, so... Oh, sorry, My you goodness, how fast did they answer? Uh, very fast, especially in person. People go crazy. Okay. So I think some people know what to expect. Like the top of the leaderboard, it was her second time, but I did give her a mixed version of the list, so she didn't know what was coming, but she knew that she had to answer fast, so... I don't know. She may have been practicing before she came on. <laughs>
But that was a lot of fun. Great way for people to get to know you. <laughs> but we are unfortunately getting to the end of the interview now, Randall. It's been a lot of fun. It's gone very quickly, as it always does. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's have the Aurora Australis. Oh, Aurora, I like it. Yeah, okay. Changing the um, background. Yeah, change of background. <laughs> yes, and a bit more serious now because it's a closing statement. Knowing what you know now, Randall, what would you tell your 14-year-old self? My, uh, buy Apple, buy Microsoft. Buy gold, buy silver. Yes. Especially um, back at 14. <laughs> Might as well get into Apple before it went huge. Well, I mean, when I think about it, I mean, I, I thought of those things, but then I thought, nah. But honestly, um, that kind of investment would have made millions. Mm. Um, so that's about the only thing I'd want to go back and tell them. Um, tell my 14-year-old self how to get laid um you know the things ladies like to hear or what what what's that movie called what women want mm. um you know maybe but otherwise um when i was 14 um gosh yeah stick stick to your guns don't waste time um you know stick to the acting i should have stuck to the acting and not gone to medical school um because that's what the aptitude tests told me to do so uh, that's what I would tell my 14-year-old self, is stick to your guns, stick to your passion, stick to your love. I wanted to be an actor. I was an actor. I wasn't bad as an actor. I even got tested for, what was it called? The Cowboys with the John Wayne. Oh, wow. As the little fat boy. I mean, <laughs> talk about stereotypes <laughs> or typecasting. The little fat boy um mm. with glasses um yeah no i mean that's the kind of like i say the opportunities that came in in santa barbara a lot of but, things um, have been different well they were just yeah. casting the casting yeah. net very far and um it landed in in santa barbara i um yeah stick to your gun stick to your love if that's what you want to do um oh gosh i i don't know why but everybody is told they have to they have to um have a real job they have to have a real profession mm. um and you don't i've never I had a real, i've never had a real job as you said <laughs> what doesn't this guy do well that's the point um makes life more interesting that way yeah it makes it poorer <laughs> you know many depends of the things what you're I, in i guess <laughs> yeah many of the things i do don't make that all, that much money but i guess i'm immortal in that i have uh assertive professional children and i've left a body of work that, and you're rich in happiness well well that's it uh mm. yeah uh, i've got a, a a long cv but um yeah stick stick with what you can do and and feel like doing well you're definitely doing an amazing job randall keep it up all right okay I appreciate interview, you coming. interview me again in a year when we <laughs> come around and i'll beat i'll beat 53 and i'll uh i'll tell you i'll look back and tell you whether you were right or not that i'm a rich man in in, in happiness. happiness yes well it seems like you are now and you're doing fantastic <laughs> with your jobs so i yeah. appreciate you coming on and telling us all about it well thanks for having me i mean i uh, thanks for digging me up um i'm not <laughs> Thank uh, you for Jeanette. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so listen to the bill show the week in politics yes if you want to hear more um with uh, me and bill tonight um, about U.S. politics and and uh, that's uh, that's my other part. That's my podcast. It's the Bill Show uh, Politics this week on Spotify. Fantastic! We'll go check it out, everybody. <laughs> I'll put. Oh, no, you don't want you don't want competition, do you? I mean, no, I should, no. You should Definitely promote that. your I podcast. Gonna, I know you're going to cut that out because um, uh, you know people shouldn't promote their own stuff on your show. So no, no, I, I actually. <laughs> I, I actually tell people to tell tell us where we can find you, promote your stuff. That, oh, that's well, there's a, for, there's so. a, I tell people don't Google me. Have you got uh, social media we can go follow you? Yeah, uh, don't don't look up IMDb, don't look up Facebook. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> it's all there. Yeah. No, I'm glad I'm glad you told us all about that. I'll put the links below for everybody as well. <laughs> check out the podcast. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not going to cut that out. Yeah. Okay. Now, where else are people supposed to promote their stuff? Knowing then what I know now, I, uh, 
Is it my fucking yes? Yes. The book behind well, me. Bring yes. it forward. Bring it forward. Put it up to the camera. Come on. Uh, boop. That's my book. <laughs> oh, I guess I guess I have kind of um, said knowing what I know now. Yes, that's like yeah. I say. Stick to your guns. That's a book filled with those quotes. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. I hope I've given you some for volume two. Mate, yes, yeah, so I was going to say, but I am thinking ah. of probably doing another one, so maybe we can be in the next one. But what a great idea. What a great idea. There's another... Thank um, you. Yeah, there's another... Uh, there are a few uh, people that have done... I wouldn't call them a self-help book, but it's uh, there's a couple of actors who've done that sort of thing in, in LA. Uh, you know, where to look, where to audition, where to, you know... Mm. Mistakes I Have Made would be my book. Uh, when I when I teach copywriting, I I have fallen back on teaching, and I've taught uh, uh, TAFE, uh, uh, junior college, I guess they call it, uh, in America, and I have uh, basically formed my lessons on mistakes I've made because I think you, you want need to, teach, to write another book. Yeah, you teach people um, mistakes you've made so they can avoid them. Mm. Um, That's what that book's all about. To yeah, help the younger yeah, generation yeah, and, yeah. you know, l learn from their mistakes so that they don't have to make them. So you don't have to make them yourself. We're yeah. all the same as well. No, no, I take that back, Lauren. Some people have to make some particular to mistakes yes. to learn from the stove is hot. You're not yes. going to believe me. Touch it, burn yourself fine, get it out of the way, but the stove is hot. Um, yeah, there are some you're going to have to learn. There, there definitely is, and there's some you don't really have to go <laughs> learn because you can also follow someone's recipe, as they say, which yeah, is what that yeah. book's all about. So, yeah. And just shows that we all go through the exact same thing around the time when we're 14 and even younger. Okay. Uh, Jeanette, but, thank you for dobbing me in. You are um, so welcome. <laughs> But I really appreciate your time. Keep in touch with us, all right, Randall? And yeah, yeah. Well, like I say, I'm a job. fan. I'm subscribing now, and I'll uh, – It'll come down to my little iPhone and I, uh, I'll do uh, listen to it on um, yeah, often. Uh, I've got it. It automatically connects when I get into the car. So I'll, uh, I'll put it on uh, high rotation. I am honored. Thank you very, very much. And tell your friends too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed today's interview. If you'd like to check out any of our other interviews, please visit our website, raveitup.tv.com. All the podcasts and videos are there for you to enjoy. And also, while you're there at our website, you can also check out our book, Knowing What I Know Now. And I also do have a little mini ebook that I put up last year called Staying Strong, Finding Inner Peace During Hard Times. Please check it out. Share it with your friends. We really appreciate any support you can give us. But for now, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.